Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Colonel Retired Chris Olshek. I'm a Vice President with the Civil Affairs Association. And uh, this is um, today the second in a opening series of civil military education web webinars. Um, the first one was in August with the CEO and President of the Alliance for Peace Building, uh, Ms. Ezra Zaya. Uh, and today, we are very honored to have Ms. Julia Roy, who heads up Partners Global. She's CEO and President of Partners Global. Um, and the, uh, Julia has been Executive Director there for quite some time. Um, and she uh, has, has, has a very strong background in uh, peace building. Um, has spent time in, uh, in, in Bogota, in Belgrade, where Julia, you and I have uh, not necessarily crossed paths at the same time, but we've been in those locations. And um, today, what we're going to be talking about is something I think that would be of tremendous interest, and that is this idea of uh, civilian resilience, which has got a lot more wordplay, as you know, in our meetings. Um, at the Civil Affairs Association events such as the, the symposium last year. Uh, and so this, this concept of resilience, civilian resilience has, has gotten more interesting. I'm in fact involved in a NATO project, a study project on civilian resilience and hybrid warfare. Um, and one of the reasons we set this civil military educational seminar series up is because we want to make people aware of what our, our uh, friends and partners are doing in, in these kinds of areas. Um, and they've been at it in, in many respects much longer and much deeper than we have. So rather than uh, reinvent wheels, uh, we can take a look at the wheels that have already been invented. And, um, and with respect to um, Partner Global, which is uh, uh, one of the leading peace building organizations in the United States, if not the world, and also with the Alliance for Peace Building, um, they have put together a rather unique uh, model for building civilian resiliency. And I think this is something that we should not only consider um, in our own best practices, but certainly even as we begin to evolve, evolve the doctrine for civil affairs, uh, we can refer to this. Uh, and. So uh, without any further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julia, and then we'll have questions and answers afterwards. Um, and so if you have questions, please uh, post those in the, in the webinar chat, and we'll recognize them after Julia gets done with her presentation, and uh, I'll read them out to her. We're in webinar mode, unfortunately, not in meeting mode, um, and, and she'll answer them. So with that, with that, please, Julia. Thank you so much, Chris. And, um, you know, I just, I really appreciate the invitation and uh, the friendship and, and collegiality with Chris for many years now. Um, so just a couple of just very brief housekeeping issues. I do see that many of you are, have said hello in the chat, um, but if you see if there's um, the two uh, who you're chatting to can either be turned to just the panelists or the panelists and all attendees. And so I think it'd be really nice if we had a conversation, if you change that to, to everyone, because um, I got to see where you all are from because it's coming to me as a panelist. So change that little button um, if you have any questions or comments as I'm speaking. And then Chris, I wanted to remind you that I sent you an email with a couple of links that hopefully you can put in the chat that has a direct link to our full framework and also some additional videos and resources that we've prepared. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to try and talk for maybe about 20 minutes. It'll be hard for me. I get very excited about um, this discussion, um, but I'd really like to hear your questions and what you're more interested in knowing about. And so if, I, if this feels like I'm going very fast, um, it's because I'm going very fast, <laughs> and I'm going to try and, and give a lot of information quickly, but there's a lot more that you can read up on. And, um, and I think it's more interesting to, to hear what you want to know more about. Um, okay, so as Chris said, uh, we've spent some time developing a framework on resiliency. 
And so I'm going to introduce myself and partners. I really want to talk about just civil society in general um, and how we conceive of resiliency. And then I'm going to introduce the factors of the framework. That's simple. So Partners Global has been around for about 30 years now, and we function as a network. Um, we have local peace building organizations that are really contributing to uh, rule of law, um, democratic governance, and uh, you know, citizen participation as our bread and butter of a peace building agenda. So we're an organization that very much partners with government institutions, with local militaries and police. Um, and we do that in a way through using conflict resolution techniques like mediation and facilitation, participatory decision making. You see here that we've got quite a strong presence in Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. Um, and most of um, our work is in West Africa at the now, um, right now. These are where we have affiliated centers. So it's a bit of a franchise model. I'm Partners Global, there's Partners Yemen, Partners Iraq, Partners Colombia, Partners Albania, Partners Nigeria. And these are local organizations that we've provided seed funding to do this work, completely locally led with their own local business models um, and staff and boards of directors. So a lot of this resiliency work was developed together with um, our network. It wasn't something that came out of a Washington DC perspective in any way. And so just to, you know, make sure that we're all on the same page of, of you know, where I come from, I am very much a part of a global civil society infrastructure. Um, but when we say civil society and when we talk about resiliency, for what? Resiliency for civil society to continue to be playing its role in a democratic um, system. What we mean is that there are organizations that serve as intermediaries between citizens and government. And, and you know, we, because we have participatory governance systems when we're in right relationship with our government, citizens need a way of organizing themselves in order to be able to advocate for um, the change or the policies or the priorities that they have within a system in order to, to participate in, in certain kind of local kind of self-governance and um, to really contribute to society. And so we take a very broad definition. Civil society is uh, academic institutions. They may be uh, PTA associations. They don't necessarily have to be formally registered non-for-profits that, you know, receive grants and um, implement projects that a foundation or maybe a, a donor like USAID might be giving them uh, money to implement programs. There may be a, uh, very informal networks of young people who come together or, um, you know, health co-ops. Co There's a whole range of the way that citizens organize themselves, but we feel that this is fundamental to um, a peaceful society where citizens have the right to organize and have the right to have a voice and opinions. And that, you know, sometimes those opinions might differ. There may be different interests, but there needs to be a valve for discussing those different interests. And so the Partners Network is very committed to when there's um, conflicts, and I mean that kind of in a small c sense, that there's mechanisms for those different interests to be negotiated. Um, and so when civil society isn't allowed to play its role in representing citizens, when there's authoritarian regimes that make sure that, you know, they control this sector, so for example, in some governments, um, they may allow for nonprofits or for associations to exist in their countries, but only um, when they're just perhaps giving out charity, when they're, um, you know, doing maternal health programs, but that they don't actually um, interact in any way to, to push the government to change health policies for mothers, for example. And so we developed our resiliency framework so that we could support civil society organizations to continue to do their work. Um, and 
Um, so I'll, I'll say that our clients in this um, work are these uh, organizations of citizens, some of them formal, some of them informal. And so I'm truly interested to know what comes to mind um, when I say the term resiliency. All of you decided to spend an hour at lunchtime, at least, if you're here on the uh, East Coast with us, talking about um, civilian resilience. And as Chris said, it's a, it's a sexy topic right now, I think specifically also because we're living through a pandemic. But I'm interested if you want to put in the chat, and I'm going to ask Chris to kind of read out some of your answers. And again, make sure you, you are sending your chat um, to everybody. What, what does resiliency mean to you? What's a synonym for resiliency? Why are, why are we talking about this? What does it mean? And Chris, can you see the chat? Since I'm in uh, share mode, I can't see what people are posting right now. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Let me know what some of the answers are. Oh, there you are. Look at that. Okay, one we have is uh, from, from Jeff, the ability to recover. Mm-hmm, exactly. And uh, we did a, just a quick, uh, a short question that we got is, are you in any Central European countries? Uh, we had... Uh, yeah, and in fact, yes. Central and Eastern Europe is where um, this work really started. Um, in Hungary, in Slovakia, uh, Poland, uh, Romania, and we're now working in the Balkans as well, Serbia, Albania, Kosovo. And we have another one, uh, another contribution from Rick Morgan, the ability to adapt to shocks. Yes, so you guys are using all of the lingo that I'm gonna be talking about, um, adaptation and shocks in particular. Um, so keep it flowing and then I'm gonna keep going. Um, okay. And Chris, you just, you keep telling me if there's some other things, so. There, there's the ability to overcome disasters and other problems, the Finnish idea of SUSU, strength, preservation, and a task that some may seem crazy to undertake. Yes. Um, the ability of a society to provide a safe and stable environment through adversity, strength of the society in the absence of a state, ability to resist attrition. Oh, that's ability interesting. Ability to withstand shocks and recover quickly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, the attrition issue is, is an interesting one. I'll try and kind of address that to the extent that I can. So, you know, really briefly, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about the root of different words um, and that resiliency comes from this Latin, I'm not gonna try and pronounce the, the Latin, but that to bounce off of. Um, and so I like this idea of, you know, the shield that somebody is bouncing a ball off of us. And you know, in the 1950s, there was a whole bunch of natural science around resiliency, right? They were looking at the adaptation that happened quite naturally within different ecosystems um, that would constantly be adapting to these kind of threats to the system. And then in the 70s, there was an application of resiliency thinking to psychology um, and education in particular, and really started looking at the human capacity to withstand shocks and, and trauma, in fact. Um, and then, you know, more recently, and I would say starting after um, the 2000s, that this has been a concept that's very much been incorporated into international development and peace building. And it's been tied in the literature to a concept of sustainability. You know, how do we sustain gains that we've made? How do we sustain um, systems and organizations and networks um, so that we're putting the world back into balance um, with some of the, the thinking around uh, sustainability as balance. But I think that there was an evolution to realize we're never going to be in a completely um, balanced world. And because as many of you have said, we're, we're trying to manage complexity and quickly shifting um, scenarios in a, an imbalanced world. And so the essence for us of resiliency is that ability to adapt, um, to adapt swiftly, purposely to shocks or impacts in a way that we're not just um, surviving, but we're thriving. And so our interest is looking at organizational resilience 
um, specifically, again, because I said citizens have to organize themselves under an organizational umbrella in some way to be able to interact um, with those governance institutions. And so we look at the way that civil society adapts um, to external conditions, prepares for that, responds effectively, has a cap capability of looking at the system that they operate into to understand those interconnections and those influences um, so that they really are looking at um, prevention of um, a lack of resiliency um, and then being able to be responsive. And so it does require a different mindset for us as civil society leaders. You know, we're a passionate group. <laughs> we, we, we get very excited about our issue areas and whether that's, you know, preventing, you know, cancer and cancer awareness, um, you know, for breast cancer survivors, or whether it's, you know, youth violence prevention or, you know, environmental kind of stewardship, you know, there's activists are, are, are passionate. Um, and yet sometimes those mindsets of the organizational um, strength and systems and practices and policies that we need, even as informal networks, you know, it's something, it's a muscle that we need to build as a sector, quite honestly. And I'm saying that as someone who's been in the sector for about 30 years now. So Partners Global went on a journey together with our network and some other peer organizations. Um, though some of you may have heard of an organization called Civicus. They're based in South Africa and they're also a membership-based organization. They have thousands of uh, citizen um, uh, and civil organizations around the world, we work together with Civicus to do some really deep thinking about how to apply uh, sustainability and resiliency thinking to our sector. Um, and we really did look at peer um, fields, adjacent fields, whether it was natural resource um, preparedness, um, looking at some of the crises and how you um, build resiliency. And we came up with seven factors. And I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but we needed to organize ourselves in a way to say, how do we improve civil society's resiliency so that it's not just one thing? Because a lot of donors and foundations who wanna strengthen civil society organizations, so that, young, that group of youth actors in Libya who are using arts for peace, um, and doing really creative work of bringing different sectors and tribes and, and folks together through the arts. We think about sustaining their work financially. A lot of times we think, how are they gonna have a sustainable business model so that they can keep paying for their work? And we think that that's resiliency. Um, and so we've seen a lot of organizations be able to continue to pay for their work and yet somehow when those shocks and crises hit, they can't weather that storm. And so we feel that we needed something that incorporated a lot of different areas of support to organizations so that they could continue um, to adapt and thrive. So the one thing that I do want to say is I'm going to go through each of these one by one because these are our seven factors of resiliency. Each of them have three sub factors. They are all totally interconnected. So that what we found is, is when we do an assessment with our different civil society organizations to say, okay, where are you strong? Where are you weak? How, where can we improve? If we start working in one area, we see that other areas um, within this framework can, can start to improve. And at the same time, if you're really falling down on one of these factors, it really affects um, other factors. And so even though I'm gonna go through this systematically, we really do look at this as, as a very kind of comprehensive and interlinked framework. Um, okay, so many of you mentioned adaptation um, and the ability to adapt. And so what we um, work with, and I, I do wanna say we, we have a, um, a very generous grant right now from uh, the US Agency for International Development um, their democracy um, and human rights um, uh, DRG center, their learning group, they're allowing us to pilot this framework in about uh, eight different countries right now. So we're working with over 70 organizations 
in Cambodia, in Kenya, in uh, Serbia, in Nigeria, Senegal, Georgia, and soon to be uh, Ecuador, Ukraine, and Tanzania. And so we're really testing this out in the field right now, working with live organizations, trying to say, okay, what does adaptive capacity really look like in practice? And we see that there's um, a leadership mindset, which very much um, acknowledges that uh, we don't know what's coming and we need to constantly be preparing our organizations at all levels for that ability to adapt. And so uh, what I would say about, you know, flexible governance means that you have the ability, you don't have such strict um, infrastructure and network hierarchies, you know, lots of red tape that you can't respond to what's happening in your environment. But the contingency planning in particular, another way of saying this is scenario planning, which the military is so good at. And I've, you know, participated in a ton of tabletop exercises where I get to play, you know, the civil society um, actor to run those scenarios to say, well, what would we do if this happened? Um, we try and do that scenario planning with our civil society organizations so that they, they start to build up that muscle. The other thing, because that's more of the kind of formal practices. There are a lot of informal practices. There's an ethos around um, resiliency of how you embrace that uncertainty. And so you, you know, the ethos of being a learning organization, how do you um, include the space to try new things? And so if you have a culture of resiliency, when somebody tries something new and fails, um, are they ridiculed? or are they supported? Those kinds of practices that you put within a network, within an association, within an organization. Um, but more than anything, what we're working on right now is just staff well-being. And again, I, you know, I know that this is something that the military is also very good at, where you practice being under stress and then continuing to be able to function. <laughs> and right now, our sector is under a lot of stress. And whether it's because of the pandemic um, situation that, you know, even all over the world, you know, young parents are trying to work at the same time that they're trying to um, parent children and, and deal with um, homeschooling. Um, but there's also, you know, the civil unrest um, that we feel, the social justice movements um, that are happening, the violence that's breaking out um, in, in many parts of the world, we have staff um, and leaders who are exhausted. And so having programs and, and support for well-being um, is one of the things that we're working on the most right now. Like what does it look like in practice to have that kind of psychological safety and attentiveness to when we're not um, doing okay? That's something that the peace building organizations do very well in fact, because we have a whole body of work on dealing with trauma victims. Um, but normally we apply a lot of that knowledge externally and uh, we're, we're starting to learn how to apply that trauma and healing internally to our, our staff and, and our organizations as well. Um, the next factor is situational awareness and being able to think um, along the lines of the system um, that we're working within. And um, you know, again, I, I'm so glad to be talking to you as a community because a lot of, a lot of our, our thinking we drew um, from, from some of the practices that, that the military applies to understanding where those external threats might be coming um, from and to, to be constantly assessing um, those threats um, to be able to then adapt accordingly. And when I talk about threats to the civil society sector, they could be um, you know, that, that when working under an authoritarian regime and you're an association of journalists that are trying to protect an independent media in your environment and you do some investigative journalism and maybe you're trying to bring to light a corruption case, you are actually um, targeted and, um, and under threat. And so it may be, you know, at a very personal level, the organization, there may be a smear campaign against that organization um, in the press. Those are the kinds of threats that I'm talking about, but they could also be environmental threats. Um, they could be threats um, in the funding sector. So we have a lot of organizations that are working in areas that 
you know, the donor community, foundations, bilateral organizations like the EU and, and USAID that used to give a lot of money for the kind of work that we do have decided the country has graduated and, and they pull out. And so a changing in the funding dynamics really um, affects us. Internal vulnerabilities is something a little bit more sensitive to talk to our colleagues about because these are issues around, let's say, um, a leadership pipeline. Is there succession planning? Is there a really um, charismatic leader that founded that association for environmental justice? Um, but if that leader left, the whole thing would fall apart. And so we talk about succession planning. We talk about leadership pipelines. We talk about the way that um, you apply democratic practices within your organization, um, that young people, that um, you know, minorities who are representative of the communities that you serve are a part of your organizations um, to, to um, work on those potential internal vulnerabilities. And then finally, the systems awareness. We do a lot of training on just systems thinking, um, which is you know, another sexy topic. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about how we do that, not just within one organization, but we bring groups of organizations together and we really try and bring in a diversity of actors. And a lot of times the security sector um, locally, and that means local military, local police, um, gendarmerie in, in some uh, countries, actually will come and, and do a, a systems mapping with our organization so that we have a more complete view of that system because then you have to prepare accordingly. Um, and this is uh, the factor that has to do with financial preparation. So I did say that, you know, it's not just about having a, a funding stream to continue to do your work. You know, if you want to be continually working on breast cancer awareness um, for women in the Middle East, which is continues to be a taboo subject, unfortunately, to be able to talk about this, you need to have money for your staff, for your office, for your campaigning. And so um, what we've found is it's you do need to have a diversification of revenue if we're only relying on foundations or private philanthropists, um, that, that's a risk. Um, so that if that one donor pulls out, like I said, you know, you're kind of left, you know, what do I do? So we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, are there products and services that we can sell? There's all sorts of innovative ways that communities, small communities are, are giving money, and it could be 50 cents a month of a membership um, formula to keep that local organization or that association alive. And so we try and kind of uh, open up the, uh, open up the, the possibilities of, of making money. And then this means really that you have to be able to have a mindset of innovating. And you know, the business community has, a, has the luxury of having investment capital to innovate and, and iterate and try new things and fail fast um, to try something else that will eventually make them money. Um, we try and bring a little bit of that ethos into um, the civic sector. And so maybe it's an app that's tracking you know, when potholes get fixed in a community. Um, so that you can say, like, what are the government services that we need so that we can communicate really quickly? And so maybe there's an app that, you know, there's some kind of profit um, uh, framework that allows that app to, to stay um, relevant and useful for citizens. You know, it's these kinds of innovations. And then finally, we've got to obviously think about preparing to have funds for a rainy day and, and the rest of that. Okay, just a couple of more. So I I talked a little bit about how we do situational awareness through connectivity and connectedness. And I, I do wanna say this is one of the most important factors of our resiliency framework. All of them are important, but this one is really important. We can't be resilient alone. Um, as a field, as activists, as citizens, um, you know, and to be honest with you, I think all of us at a time um, of the pandemic are both seeing the value and the need for this connectivity within society to address um, you know, these threats that we're under. And at the same time, there's kind of polarization tendencies that are really pulling us apart. And so we look at, are, we, um, are there network of networks? Um, so if, you know, how, how are 
those associations of young people connected with a UN program of, of global youth peace builders um, so that they're learning, so that they have um, moral support um, when those threats survive, so that there's an act of solidarity. There's a young woman in Pakistan who was really activating or advocating for girls' education and her parents were kidnapped. I mean, this literally just happened months ago. And she, because she was a part of a lot of different global networks, could really put pressure on, um, you know, the powers that be in Pakistan uh, to let her parents go. Um, and they're still there, they didn't leave, but there was such an outpouring of support um, for her and for her family um, that that's the kind of solidarity that supports us when those kinds of real threats um, uh, to a person's safety. And then, you know, collaborating to create shared value, we're purposely using business terms here because we do have a hard time working with our, our civil society organizations who may be in an activist role um, who are providing a watchdog function, let's say against, you know, big mining companies or extractive industry um, organization or extractive companies, big footprint companies, forestry or, or oil and gas mining, um, that we say, you know, we have to be in relationship with these companies. We need to um, both be um, uh, stating the injustices that we see, the conflict dynamics that we think are being perpetuated, and yet we also need to kind of bridge build with those organizations um, and specifically the private sector in order to find the common ground when we do have shared values in order to address um, these societal um, issues together. And so we do a lot of brokering of relationships between businesses um, and citizen groups. Um, this is something that's near and dear to my heart, which is narrative competency. And I was reading um, some of the outcomes of your uh, meeting at the end of last year, where you also were talking about uh, narratives as a driver of conflict. Um, and we look at how organizations are engaging with narrative, not necessarily just as a strategic communications um, issue, but as real sense making. We see how um, uh, narrative frames are used for, for polarizing and divisive purposes. And yet, um, there's, a, there's a lot of research around how we can engage with narratives in a way that allows us um, to advocate for restoring societal relationships. So I'm not going to get into that too much. That's It's actually a pet project of mine. If you want to talk about narrative competency in particular, you know, this is a whole field of practice in and of itself and something um, that we focus on a lot because this is one of the competencies within our sector that we need to build up this muscle in order to engage both in social media, in the campaigning um, that our sector does in a way that isn't further polarizing. And then this last one is just that our sector has to be working with transparency. One of the ways that we're held to criticism when those authoritarian um, regimes come into power and don't want any opposition and they start going after potential um, human rights organizations that are organizing um, for different policies, they talk about um, NGOs that receive funding from foreign agents, um, they criticize organizations that don't have strong ties to a community constituency, and so they're really just out of it, you know, to be making money. Um, and so how we have a credibility, um, how we're walking our talk, how we really do have those feedback loops to represent citizens is an important um, component. And so I jumped ahead because I need to finish, so at least we've got about 15 and 20 or 20 minutes, if we're going to stay a couple of minutes over, Chris, is, um, you know, how can civil affairs incorporate this um, framework into what you do? And I, this is just me doing my own brainstorming um, this morning as I was thinking about the presentation. And yet, you know, I think that it, it warrants an ongoing conversation. And, and Chris and I are kind of cooking up the way that we might continue to engage with you about what this resiliency framework might work, might mean um, for your work. Um, but here's some just initial thoughts. You know, because connectivity, as I said, was one of the most important aspects of civilian resiliency for us, 
then you in your role um, and your presence there can help to spur and make those local connections. And I do think that there's, you know, because we all travel in different circles, we have access to different people in a local context, we need to find those connector people who help, who become nodes of connectivity, which is gonna help to spur um, the resiliency of those civil society organizations. Um, because the military is so good at scenario planning that you have a method of doing this, um, this is not something, like I said, that our sector knows how to do very well. And so I think supporting the scenario planning capability of local actors, actually running through contingency planning and scenario planning jointly um, with civilian organizations, I think would be a huge contribution um, to both their capabilities, but then also understanding the systems dynamics that, um, that as kind of joint um, actors trying to work for peace and stabilization in a, in a local context, this would go a very far way because we, we struggle. I have to say I struggle um, with my colleagues to make this real to them, why contingency and scenario planning is important. Um, I think um, that participating actively in those information networks, so this isn't just making local connections, but also just actively sharing information, because if we want to be improving our situational awareness, we need to have access to those early warning um, triggers, we need to understand the crisis dynamics, and so I think actively participating in those information networks. Um, I didn't talk so much about this, but if, if um, you know, through whatever channels of information you have access to, that you're also engaging with the narrative that is um, working to, for de-escalation, um, and that whatever messaging campaigns um, that your offices are participating in are, or, or furthering are done in a participatory way. And we've had a lot of um, back and forth um, with information officers and others about our, our approach to narratives. Um, so I, I can send another link um, on our website. I'm sorry, I forgot to send that to Chris beforehand, but when we're talking, I'll, I'll put a link. We have all sorts of resources on narrative engagement, um, specifically with our Department of Defense um, colleagues. And then finally, what I would say is that you also have to operate with radical transparency um, and that modeling the way that you're engaging um, with constituents, finding those legitimate actors um, and helping them to also maintain their own credibility in the eyes of the community is gonna be supporting um, those actors to continue to kind of um, demonstrate their own legitimacy and credibility. And finally, you know, we would love um, to, to convene discussions around resiliency in some of the communities that are priorities and, and where you're working. And so, you know, we're doing this, like I said, in the nine countries that I mentioned. I was just with a group of civic um, activists in the Gambia. You know, 20 groups came together and, and I presented this and we discussed, you know, how they were thinking about resiliency. And I think it would be very powerful um, to be able to do those workshops together. Um, so I am going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because now I think it's time for questions. I'm sorry, I tried really hard to go fast, um, but it's a lot um, to cover. And so, Chris, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to, I'm in the chat now. And um, thank you so much um, for listening. And, uh, you know, I'll all of my information, I'll, I'll put my email up here um, so that you could always follow up with me as needed. Phew. Great. So um, we do have a question, but before, um, before we do that, what I would like to do is respond to um, going forward, uh, your last slide, and, and maybe if you have workshops that you're planning, um, if you'd like to share them with the association, we can put that on our calendar. Um, and at least it, it let people know, hey, uh, Partners Global's got some workshops coming up on resiliency in X, Y, and Z countries and these days and so on, and here's the link. Sure. Um, and, and if you want to have somebody just share that with me, and we'll get that up on the calendar of events so that uh, that's coming down the pipeline. Um, and we, you know, we obviously have civil affairs and cynic uh, partners all around the world. 
um, and they might be able to contribute. Um, they, there's a link that they can go to to um, get further information and contact the people who are putting together that particular workshop. Okay, so we have our first question is from Major Sabo from from uh, the uh, Simic Center for Excellence uh, in Den Haag, the Netherlands. Um, he says it's also a coincidence that NATO also has seven resilience baseline requirements when it comes to address the main domains of civil preparedness in NATO countries. Have you studied that approach? Um, so, they, they, and the side remark was that they're, you know, bravo. It's it, they really think that uh, we need to pay more attention as a, a wider learning organization, which I'm to promote here, a wider community. Um, we really need to get, dive deeper together into this uh, resiliency topic. So, if you would uh, field that first. Yeah, and I and I now do also have the questions up, Chris, so I can also see the the next okay. one. So, you know, we yes is the answer. Although, you know, again, we we thought of um, NATO's framework, and I can't speak with as much um, knowledge about it as one of the kind of adjacent fields that I mentioned, because there's actually a ton of resiliency <laughs> frameworks out there. There really are. And a lot of ways that people are, are thinking about resiliency for their own environment. And so that's why I said we tried to adapt those for our civil society environment, specifically looking at organizations. But I think what you're bringing up is a way that we need to you know, now that we're doing all of this reflection on what does it look like in practice, then where are the overlaps and how are we supporting each other on our own resiliency journeys and our commitment to, you know, the different actors um, that need to be aware of, of their resiliency. And a lot of this is kind of just the ethos that I'm talking about. I spend a lot of time just talking about a resilient mindset. Um, and so I think that the fact that there's just an awareness of this as being important within these different institutions and sectors, and that we can come together and continue trying to support each other, I think is the way forward. Um, and then I do see that there's a, a, a question about contingency planning between civil actors and, um, and the military. And in fact, we've done several of those um, in West Africa, um, specifically in Liberia and in Senegal. And we, we have a security governance um, framework that we use, um, which is d looking at kind of security issues in particular. Um, and so the framework is, is taking aspects of security and then uh, convening a dialogue. So it's not necessarily scenario planning, but it's categories of, um, uh, citizen security that we then we model out you know what that looks like um, uh, what it means to citizens and what the kind of future collaboration looks like but I think it's something that we need to build out more of we have a ton of scenario planning and contingency planning frameworks and I don't necessarily know that they're the um, same ways that you do contingency planning so it's something that I think is worth um, experimenting with quite honestly um, Go ahead, John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Julia, thank you very much for your remarks. And I was wondering for the, uh, the countries you had mentioned where you're field testing this uh, resiliency framework, are you already collaborating with civil affairs forces through those country teams or do you plan on doing that? Yeah, not yet. Um, and, you know, Chris is the one who reached out to me. And so we've got to find the right pilot to do it in. And, you know, Nigeria, I think might be a good one, um, for example. And so not yet, um, but the fact that we're making these connections right now, um, we're really inspired to take that forward and also then ground it um, where we're operating. Thanks. Yeah, so what we need to do for you, Julia, is to identify a point of contact, uh, maybe from Fort Bragg or somewhere where we can create that relationship um, so that that coordination can take place. Uh, out to the civil affairs world and the partners of civil affairs. So um, there's some different ways ahead here. What, what I wanted to ask you before we go to the next question from uh, Anton is um, 
Have you been, who have you been talking with, uh, if anyone, over in the Pentagon or, or, you know, who have you already been talking with about the, the obvious overlaps between your work and the work of DOD? Yeah, and I, you know, I'm going to get my lingo wrong, and I'm sorry for that, because now it makes me want to go back and make sure that I get all of the titles right. Um, are there information officers? Is that is that what they're called? Infor information operations. Yes. Information operations, um, or, or soon, perhaps soon to become called inf information warfare. Yeah. The Army yes. right now is considering changing it from information operations to information warfare. Yeah, and so, you know, they're super interested in this topic of, uh, you know, the war of ideas and and um, engaging with narratives. And so we jointly held a conference. Chris, did you come to that event with George, at George um, Washington University? Yeah, maybe not. No, and we've held, so. Uh, we, so we had all branches of the military um, attend with several of our um, narrative um, experts and peace building colleagues. We videotaped all of the sessions and they're up on our um, YouTube page. And so I'm, I'm going to copy that link right now so that I can give it to all of you. And, um, you know, it's, that was a, that was a more than a year ago. And so the, 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 the relationship is there, um, mostly through, um, uh, through George Washington University, to be honest with you, they're the kind of holders of that space um, where these the um, information officers are coming together. But it's been, like I said, I mean, we're, we're very um, open to that collaboration and have had several conversations. It's a matter of now taking it forward and making it actionable. Okay, so the question yeah, from I'm Shannon, like, maybe we can go back to that. Yeah, go ahead, because I'm going to look for this um, link and I'll let you ask for the question. Go ahead, Chris. Um, the, Shannon's actually got two questions. Um, the first one is you spoke about how engaging the, the youth or young adult population is so important to work, which is, can't understate that enough. How do you ensure that they have the power to not only practice resiliency, maintain resiliency, especially in areas where the power is held by particular groups. Um, yeah, I mean, why don't I take that one first? Take that one and then we'll go to the second question. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I'll tell you, this is, it. there's a, a big question about this, isn't there? Um, and I, I'm gonna kind of show my hand a little bit. There's a, there's a lot of organizations in our field who are, are really supportive of youth organizations in particular, self-organizing um, and kind of maintaining that power um, themselves in order to really represent their viewpoints to police, you know, their um, peers and, and to be kind of active in their communities as youth. And while I think that that's right, and we applaud those efforts, um, I'm, I get a little bit worried that they, they silo youth organizations unnecessarily away from and separate from other organizations that can also support those efforts as peers with additional infrastructure, with other wisdom. So what we spend a lot of time doing is linking up youth organizations with other organizations, dare I say, those that may be run by old timers. <laughs> um, and so we prep those old timers a lot on power dynamics, on how to respectfully work with young people, um, but that we're building bridges between generations um, so that collectively there's more power um, within that um, dynamic and, and maybe it's youth um, violence prevention, and you know, we do a lot of this work um, in Central America and in other in Mexico. And you know, the the family infrastructure and the the mentors that are available to young people who who may be radicalized and and um, susceptible to going into gangs, for example, it it can't just be youth organizations addressing that problem. And so we spend a lot of time building bridges between youth definitely understanding the power dynamics, but that part of that power is, is through their collaborations with other um, sectors. 
Okay. Um, the, the other question that uh, Shannon had was um, that, you know, how can we do uh, a better job of getting the, the, the civil and the, the military communities working together on information sharing on, on, uh, on building things, the frameworks and the best practices? And I mean, part of my answer is what we're doing right now, but more of it. Yeah, that's so, right. You know, and particularly at the more at the rather than the policy level, which is I think you've been engaged in George Washington University, uh, getting to the to the level closer to the operator level, um, really a big focus uh, is improving on the ties among young professionals, both in the civil affairs and. The yeah, I, you know, what I do want to say is that, um, you know, you're right, there's a lot of bias in my sector against collaborating with the military, no question. And part of our job um, is to break down those biases. And, and uh, you know, so we do, sometimes we'll do a lot of preparation uh, with just a group of civil society organizations preparing them to then come to a meeting with our military colleagues. And we go through these biases. We, we even talk about how the language is different. Um, we have a game that we play where we use kind of military jargon and we use, you know, NGO jargon and we play a game trying to figure out to match like which words are which so that we acknowledge that we even have a different way of talking about our work. Um, and so, you know, it behooves us to break down those barriers. And, and so I think the way for you all um, to, to figure out, you know, to address that is to find the organizations that can help accompany you in making those relationships. And so because we are in the civil society mix and we are legitimate actors to be working with some of those more grassroots or community-based organizations, the entry point being us or a consortium of us and our partners, you know, is the right entry point. Um, so it's exactly like Chris said, we just need to be in these conversations a lot more. And, and we have a question actually in the Q&A box um, from Adam, and I understand John can bring Adam up to, uh, for him to ask the question directly to you. Yeah, well, I see so, him just, Adam, do you want to turn on your, com your video? Because I see your name has popped up. I'm not exactly sure how to get the video on here. There wasn't really a button for it, but can you hear me? I can. Okay. So um, a while a while ago, I took a course from uh, that was that was written um, from a guy that that wrote the resistance operating or the the joint resistance operating concept, and it was uh, a piece of literature written for the Baltics which was basically a national resiliency plan against a foreign occupier. Mm. So, so more, more militaristic than civil, but mm -hmm. all components of civil society were included with this um, particular plan. But in there, they, they, they talk about narratives, um, you know, as far as, as, far as uh, preparedness, um, contingency plans for leadership, you know, what would we do with our leaders? Um, should we be uh, invaded in some way, shape or form? You know, having a, a removed um, shadow government, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But in there, it talks about um, their narratives, strong sense of national identity. Um, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm curious how your organization choose what's the selection method that you all choose to follow a certain narrative because there's so there's so many threads to pull there that yeah. at time when you're when you're looking um for that for that magic key that's going to unlock so many different um areas of a venn diagram that you lay over a map right what, how, how do you all choose that selection? Because you got to just start somewhere, but, but we want to do it um, in, in the best way possible. So I'll, I'll defer to you. Yeah. 
Um, it's, wow, it's, it's a great question, and I could talk about it for a long time. One thing that I really want to let you all know about, sorry, I'm looking for a book that I want to show you. Um, this just came out. <laughs> um, I'll put it in the chat. Root Narrative Theory and Conflict Resolution, Professor Solon Simmons. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. And, um, you know, picking the right narrative is not how I describe what we do. What we do is we analyze the stories that we hold as truisms. And what I mean by that is how are we making sense of this scenario? Um, our role, our identity, the role of our partners, the people who think like us. So it's, it's really based in kind of uncovering existing narratives and then looking at other narratives that are also in the mix, in the zeitgeist. And where, what's the basis of those narratives? And so why I, why I mentioned root narrative theory and conflict resolution is he kind of boils down the, the fundamental elements of these stories of are they security, dignity, interdependence. I can't remember all of them and because he's got, I think, four big ones and then have three each, so he's got a nice framework. We've been working with him in countries like Bahrain, Bahrain um, to uncover um, these narratives because I feel like once we understand the basis of the narratives that we're up against, it's, it's less of a campaign to convince someone to think differently. And it's more about engaging in those narratives. So, you know, some of the work that we did at this conference with our Department of Defense um, colleagues was talking about hijacking narratives um, so that we can not necessarily try and have a bigger megaphone, a more creative campaign, a better narrative to change people's minds. It's an engagement strategy to say, you are making sense of this situation in this way. I'm making sense of the situation in this way. Is there a way that we can braid together? That's actually a, a term, narrative braiding, um, so that I'm not gonna ask you to give up your identity and your, um, and your sense making. So um, I, that's not such a great answer. It's just a sw slightly different shift from choosing a narrative to then being curious about what the narratives are, to then be able to either build upon them or, or strengthen some of them and kind of try and, and hijack others um, to braid it together with ours. So you know, that was a wonky answer, but I'd love to talk to you more about it at some point. Uh, that was a perfect answer. I, I appreciate you showing those, those various layers of how you um, analyze your operational areas. That's what we call it, I guess. It would be analyzing our operational area, so. I really, um, I would recommend if you're interested in this to go, I put a link in the chat to our um, narratives for peace and security. Um, and we literally have a link to, to all of the um, presentations. They're like 10 minute Ignite talks from different leaders and, and a whole list of resources um, that you can really geek out on this topic <laughs> if you'd like. Um, can do and will do. Excellent. Thank you. Um, got so, a question from Tristan. I think you may have overlooked um, Julia, so maybe you want to address that. Did you see it? Is it the one about um, you know how we um, manage the potential risk? Yeah, to manage potential risk exactly. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, you know, this is um, this is pretty um, timely. Partially because, you know, and, and I know that you all face this same challenge, we can't get um, mixed up with um, any kind of intelligence gathering um, operation when we do these types of convenings. And, and we've run into that problem, quite honestly, with some of the partnerships that we've had in Yemen um, in particular. And, and, and so part of it is, is very, those, the framework that we use, we've got we've to make sure that we have the right arms of the military or the security sector that we're um, engaging with. 
and not to confuse um, the goals of the convening. Um, and then we very carefully vet, and we have to, who we invite on our side um, as well. And so, you know, we've had some of We've had some other problems where we've had the wrong community leaders come to these events. And so, um, you know, accountability, the way that you framed um, this question of, so there are many civil society organizations that are working to hold their security um, forces accountable. And, and the way that that is framed sometimes is I'm getting ready to catch you doing something wrong so that I can slap your hands, I can make big noise about it, and I can be so indignant that you did it wrong that I'm going to shame you as much as possible. And we really try and reorient the accountability story to say it is, it is a gift to give feedback to any organization that has the public's trust to be the ones to be keeping you safe and secure, and I'm talking about local militaries, so that the accountability function of citizens giving feedback is the way a democratic society should work. And so there needs to be channels for appropriate feedback. It also shouldn't be ab abused, but that the way that I'm gonna hold my leaders accountable is a way of improving their ability to do their job. And so I work both with government institutions to receive citizen feedback and accountability mechanisms in that way, help me do my job better, help me know when it's not going right, help me know when my, you know, the frontline officers need more training, they need better community um, relations, they need to have people from the community come and speak to them about what the norms are. Um, so we do, for example, we do work with a lot of security forces in Peru, um, understanding native cultures way of communicating, which is totally different. <laughs> and so that accountability uh, mechanism is when in it's in a healthy democratic society that we should have accountability mechanisms. Now, with that said, you know, sometimes if you, you know, raise the alarm and people aren't super happy about the alarm being raised, um, then maybe there is a sense of um, that person being, um, you know, put in danger and there being risk, but we try and manage that in the way that the accountability or the conversations unfold as being seen as productive. And a lot of that is from the leadership level. And so, you know, when we get commanders who, who also prepare their team to be in a meeting with us, that they're, get, they're prepared to receive feedback <laughs> and they are prepared to see it as a gift. Hey, I mean, Julia, while, while I, I am, we're waiting for the final, uh, we're gonna allow one more question, but uh, what I thought I would do is just kind of, uh, on to your comments and, and say that you are absolutely touching base with the right youth military. Um, because civil affairs likewise has uh, a very thin line to walk. Uh, we, we realize that we have to operate um, in and amongst populations and have their trust uh, and we also are very, very concerned about being perceived as intelligence gatherers uh, exactly. because uh, that, that can lead you into a lot of trouble. Uh, I've seen it myself, um, almost got people killed. And uh, so uh, we would probably be in the field, the very right people to talk to about these sorts of things. Because we, we share that sensitivity with you. Um, so, and we understand it. Uh, so with that, I think we, we are actually, you know, creating the right institutional linkages between the, the, the right part of the military um, and organizations like yours, which we can only stand to mutually uh, benefit from greater collaboration. Um, yeah, well, we really look forward to it, um, Chris. And you know, the, it, this is such a meaty topic, you know, we're not doing it justice now. And, you know, I can tell by the questions that there's just so much more we can be digging into. I'm including here, I didn't know if you were able to, Chris, but 
here's, a, you know, I gave you a summary of a framework, but we have a long document um, that you can, you can look into. And I also have a series of short videos. Um, again, they're, they're more intended for, um, you know, our audience of, of civil society organizations. But we have both videos and um, resources under each of these areas. And if you'd like to, um, please send me an email um, be, and follow along because every two weeks we send out a resiliency roundup where we say this is, this is what we're reading and thinking about uh, along these seven factors. Um, and we take them from a whole bunch of different um, thought leaders and organizations around the world. But we're trying to promote, again, this way of thinking about resiliency. And so we'd love to share those resources with you as well. Absolutely. And, and uh, we'll work on that. We'll get that stuff up on, on, the, uh, on the net and get that. The other thing, we, uh, we have a pretty robust Facebook page for the Civil Affairs Association. So if you or somebody in your team or, or people on your team want to join us, um, and you can post uh, information there as well because it gets quite uh, quite a lot of visibility. So, so yeah, consider that. I, I You'd be hardly that. invited to join. And, and we'll um, know well, who you are. Um, and so everyone, just to say, I'm on Twitter, you know, and, and LinkedIn. I post all the time on resiliency um, to the point where, you know, my, my colleagues and my family make fun of me because <laughs> I'm talking about it so much. Um, so I really look forward to continuing the conversations and being in relationship with all of you. I'll definitely, Chris, look up um, uh, being a part of your Facebook group. And hopefully this is one of many conversations. Well, the one thing we certainly have discovered today is that um, we've, we've touched into something that, that has uh, you know, gotten some pretty good resonance here today. So we, we, there's, there is def definitely a way forward. And, and uh, so we've got proof of concept, just like we did with the talk with Azra, the, the, gen the interest that this generated. Um, but we're not done yet. We, we have another one, uh, another of these uh, series of events coming up. Uh, and it's about how peace builders measure and learn. It's on the 29th of September. And that will be uh, our friends again from the Alliance for Peace Building. We did you know, this as a segue to what Julia was talking about, that we need to better understand, uh, particularly from a systems point of view, um, what is going on. And, um, and again, uh, we, what we would be surprised in, since in, in the civil uh, affairs world, we're very, very interested in this idea of civil information and civil information management. We've had huge discussions on this. We really need to discover what our friends and partners um, who have been seized with this very issue of how do you measure, for example, the trust between the military and the society uh, in many of these countries? How do you, how do you, you know, measure civil society? How do you measure resilience? Um, and these are things that, that um, folks like you, uh, most of us are, are kind of, are kind of occasional, have an occasional interest in this, but you, you guys are, you know, sort of the professionals. You're, you're seized with this, and a lot of the staff of these organizations are seized with these problems almost on a 24 7 day. And we're going to meet two of those young people uh, uh, on the 29th of September. So I, I commend you to, um, to join us on the 29th to talk about measures. Uh, and then we'll take a little break because we have the Civil Affairs Symposium uh, from the 5th to the, uh, the 7th of October, and there'll be announcements up on that next week. Uh, we also have our key logger engagements. Uh, if you go on and you can sign up on the Civil Affairs website, uh, and please consider joining the association for you military professionals out there because um, we have an awful lot behind the login wall that, that uh, uh, including things like these kinds of presentations recorded um, that you can tap into. So uh, once again, our, our heartfelt thanks to Julia for... Uh, for enlightening us today and uh, a fascinating subject. And, and thank you, uh, Julia, for everything that you do in your service. Peace. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks for everyone for taking the time. It was a real pleasure. Um, I look forward to continuing the conversations. And I tried to put as many links in the chat as possible. 
um, so that you can dig into the topics. I just put our Narratives for Peace um, guidebook as well, which is separate from resiliency, but because you've got so much interest in narratives, which I'm glad to hear about, um, I think it's one of the number one things that will make the biggest difference in the world is figuring out this narrative competency piece. So thank you very much and good luck to all of you wherever you are staying, you know, healthy and safe and secure and, and resilient. Thanks to everybody for, for joining us today and thanks to John for helping us out on the technical side and uh, we'll see you all later. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye now.